I think we'll get started. Josh can join us in a minute. Well, welcome everyone. Um, this is the second session of the last day of the Showcase of Undergraduate Scholars. Um, it's been a wonderful two days. And so in this session, we are going to hear um, from students who are in the College of Agriculture from various um, disciplines. So just to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, just as a reminder, this presentation is being recorded. Um, we do encourage students to ask questions to the presenters. Um, feel free to um, support and encourage the other students that are in this session. With us, um, we have Dr. Chad Risco, who's our um, director of undergrad, the Office of Undergraduate Research with us. And so he will be uh, moderating this session. Um, questions can be asked a couple different ways. We encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A box. Um, if you don't have or have trouble with your Q&A box, you can use the chat room or you can just verbally ask. We've had students who have preferred to do that over the last couple of days. So either way is fine with us. So without further ado, um, let's get started, Chad. Yeah. So hi, everybody. So it's, it's great to be here and to um, you know, have this opportunity to learn about your research. Um, as a chemist by training, you know, this is exciting for me to kind of see maybe some more applied and some and, and bigger scale chemistry than what we normally think about in, in our lab. Um, so, you know, I'm really looking forward to um, some really great presentations today. And so to get things kicked off, we have Anissa. Anissa, are you ready to go? All right. And just a reminder for everybody, your presentations are 10 minutes and we will try to have that 10 minutes include both your presentation and the questions. Okay. So whenever you're ready, Anissa. Okay, do I share my screen for? Yes. All right. Sorry, I wasn't sure exactly. All right, Is, there we go. All right, so um, my, I'm Anissa Rain. I'm a senior at UK majoring in kinesiology with hopes to attend physical therapy school after I graduate in December. And my um, person I reported to was Kendra Wu. And I had a partner, Lauren Ginter, but she's unable to make it today because of class issues. She had a presentation, so it will just be me. But um, my project was on assessing health behaviors and stress among college students before and since the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many people in different ways. Um, as a student, I've experienced firsthand how it's impacting students just like me. Um, we had to trans transition to virtual learning and we had to have limited contact with our peers, our friends and our teachers. I know for the overall population, there was a lot of fear of COVID, of contracting COVID, at least initially. So we, it was limited physical activity. We wouldn't want to go to gyms, wouldn't really want to go to parks. Um, grocery shopping was also a fear, but I think that's gotten a little better now. Um, so the purpose of this cross-sectional survey research is to assess behaviors and health measures of a convenient sample of college students involved in a service organization that focuses on health and well-being. This service organization is called the Campus Kitchen at the University of Kentucky. And I'm the secretary for this organization, so I had easy contact with the students I used for my survey. And Campus Kitchen is a student-led volunteer organization that serves to reduce food waste and food insecurity on UK's campus and in the greater Lexington community by providing those in need with resources. As far as I know, there's limited evidence on experiences, health behaviors, and the overall health and well being of college students during the pandemic. So I did this hoping that it would shed some light on this and give us more insight onto how COVID has impacted students. Key findings of this study are that compared to before the start of the COVID 19 pandemic, the average time spent participating in moderate and vigorous physical activity each day decreased by 28.2 and 26.4 minutes, respectively. 
the average time spent sitting each day increased by 97 minutes, which of course has something to do with school being online. But I know that a lot of students still try to make efforts to get their physical activity in because it's hard to sit all day. Um, and students experiencing high stress increased from 4% to 22%. To conduct the survey research, we provided an anonymous survey through Qualtrics to 40 students in February of 2021. And the questions in this survey um, asked about how COVID-19 had impacted the health and well-being of students. Survey measures included a 10-item perceived stress scale, engagement in physical activity, and the demographics of students. Um, our results showed that, well, out of the 40 students who were given the survey, 27 of them actually filled out the survey and completely participated. As you can see in the table for demographics, the average age was about 20 years, one third of the participants were males, while about two thirds were females. And in regard to race, it was a little less diverse, but we still had 30% of non-white students who participated. Um, living situation, about a quarter of students lived on campus while three fourths lived off campus. And as you can see from the pie charts below, before the pandemic, there was 70% um, of students who had moderately high stress, while there were only 4% with high stress. But after the pandemic, the amount of students with low stress decreased. I would assume that many of the students who had moderate stress before the pandemic turned to high stress after the start of the pandemic. So that could explain how it went from 56% moderate and 22% high stress after the start of the pandemic. And our results align with the results of different studies that have studied similar aspects of how the pandemic has impacted students. Another study has found that the average amount of time spent participating in physical activity has decreased since the start of COVID. Another, a different study from that found that the increased perceived stress levels of college students have occurred due to COVID as well. In conclusion, since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, there have been some decreased positive health behaviors and well-being among students, along with increases in stress. Uh, we know that students, this shows that students are experiencing challenges in dealing with the changes that COVID has caused. More rigorous randomized control longitudinal studies are recommended and there's a need for innovative interventions that aim to improve health behaviors and reduce stress among college students. Due to these results, Lauren and I have designed a, um, an education-based curriculum that will aim to be an intervention for students that hopes to just increase their overall health and well-being with an emphasis on physical activity and stress because those are what we found to be the most impacted from COVID. But overall, this intervention should have a holistic approach to health and well-being. So we just hope to offset some of the negative consequences that COVID has had on college students' well-being. And that is all. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, yes. thank you so much. Uh, Would you like me to leave the poster up for now? That works for now. Um, let me ask, does anybody in the audience have questions to get us started? And you can just chime in if you would like. Okay, so if not, so, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by your study here, you know, especially from the perspective of a faculty member, right, who watched students in my class, right, start to deal with the, the, mm -hmm. the abrupt change, right? Um, in March of last year. So, yeah. um, <laughs> and I know it was, you know, I know it wasn't easy for you. It wasn't easy, you know, for the faculty too. So one, it'd be interesting to know, you know, if there were similar studies on faculty, but oh, true. Um, do what, I mean, can you maybe go into a little bit more detail about your, your prescribed um, education? Um, so the education, um, we plan to do a it will be on the course of 12 weeks. So the students who will who did the survey are actually shift captains. So Campus Kitchen has um, it's has different shifts. So one is like preparing food, cooking food, delivering food to those in need. And there's students that are in charge of each of these shifts. So those are the people who are in the survey. And they have shift captain meetings every two weeks. So I plan to attend the shift captain meetings and kind of just like a PowerPoint slideshow, and there's a pre and post test survey that we will implement. And this will hopefully just help them since they're required to attend the meeting, they'll, um, and the, those who have done the survey will also watch the presentation 
And we're just hoping that if they learn more and participate in activities too that we suggest and can do together, it'll just help them to gain the knowledge that they can offset these challenges they face by themselves and hopefully they can use it to help those they serve as well. Sure. So have you, have you thought about too um, doing the survey again now that things are maybe trending in a, in a better direction in terms of increased vaccine? Yeah, I have thought about that. Like kind of like not post COVID, but like nearing the end of like the impacts of, cause now we have like in-person classes too. Right. So some of the questions we'll have on our survey will include like, do you think virtual learning compared to in-person learning, like how did that impact your overall well-being and things like mm -hmm. that? Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Anissa. This was a great study that thank you had you. And, 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 an, and an excellent presentation as well. So thank you. So I guess we will now turn um, to the second speaker, which is Taylor. All right. Hi, Taylor. Hello. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? How are hanging in there? So you can go ahead and share your screen and um, we'll, yes. we'll turn the floor over to you when you're ready. Yes, there it is that I want. Okay, so my name is Taylor Napier and I'm introducing my project on the effects of a honey or a sucrose diet on the aggression of guard bees towards returning foragers in Apis mellifera or the European honeybee. So the first thing I want to do here is I want to introduce robbing behavior for anybody who's unfamiliar. Robbing behavior occurs when a strong or like a hardier hive will steal honey out of sort of a weaker hive. This usually occurs when there's sort of like a dearth of, of nectar resources, specifically it happens happens often later, often later in the summer. In order to sort of accomplish this, it really stretches the social fabric of the robbing hive. And to do this, uh, the robbing hive has to be able to change from focusing primarily on foraging for resources uh, to setting up all of these robbing preparations. To do this, the robbing hive has to be able to recruit enough robbing foragers to completely overwhelm the defenses of the victim hive. And we've seen in previous studies that the robbing hive will become more aggressive in uh, sort of anticipation of this robbing behavior. So specifically, uh, there are two changes, I mean, when the robbing hive becomes more aggressive. First, we see this behavioral change. And to just throw out some definitions, uh, a forager is a worker bee whose job it is to go out and collect pollen or nectar for the hive. A guard bee's responsibility is to sort of ensure that any bee that enters the hive is supposed to be there and to keep any sort of um, rival bee from, from entering the hive that shouldn't be there. In anticipation of this robbing behavior, we see that guards become more aggressive uh, behaviorally towards their own returning foragers. You can see that over here in this figure. And on top of these behavioral changes, we've also seen gene expression changes. Um, specifically, in previous studies, we saw that robbing, uh, whoops, I'm sorry, robbers show high aggression uh, gene expression during robbing behavior. The exact cause of these behavioral and genetic changes are unknown, but it really could be what triggers this sort of robbing behavior in honeybees. So in order to uh, investigate these uh, behavioral and genetic changes, we wanted to first uh, sort of look at what previous studies had found about robbing behavior. And we saw that in previous studies, when robbing foragers went out and sort of invaded these sort of fake hive with no uh, rival guard bees, we still saw these behavioral and genetic changes. That would suggest that these, uh, these sort of changes in aggression aren't like as a result of going out and sparring with these rival guard bees and happen actually before the robbing behavior takes place. Anecdotally, a lot of beekeepers think that it's feeding on honey in their own hive that triggers this sort of robbing behavior. So we started with a hypothesis that it could be specifically foraging and feeding on honey that triggers this behavioral and genetic change. In order to, to test our hypothesis, the very first thing we did is we would take um, a hive out, a colony out, and we would train it to forage at a specific feeder that we could fill with sort of whatever treatment we want. Specifically, we would fill that feeder either with honey or with sucrose. Sucrose was sort of meant to be our control to simulate like a, a more common nectar uh, sort of thing that they were, they were foraging on. We would do this over the course of four days. We would have two uh, honey days and two sucrose days. Once they were trained uh, to forage at the speeder, we would observe the guard reactions to these returning foragers. 
and we would repeat this with four hives. So the first thing we wanted to be able to do was gauge the general temperament of these guard bees uh, based on like whether uh, which treatment they were getting. The best way that we found to do this is to perform what we call an aggression assay. For an aggression assay, you count every aggressive behavior you see a guard bee perform for one minute and you repeat this for every 10 minutes over like a 60 minute um, data collection period. Lucky for us, honeybees, specifically guard bees, have a pretty um, distinct sort of hierarchical um, uh, escalating display of behaviors that they have towards um, returning foragers. The first behavior is by far also the most common. It's called antenation. And antenation is just where they, they come up and they rub their antennae on sort of these returning foragers just to get a whiff of them and make sure that they should be there. This happens all the time and it's not really like terribly aggressive. They're just checking to make sure they should be there. The next behavior, uh, next most common is mandibulation, which is just uh, antenation with the mandibles open. So it's slightly more threatening than an antenation, but still sort of a lower order aggressive behaviors. The next three behaviors are what we would think of sort of as the more higher order aggressive behaviors. And it starts with biting, which is as you would imagine, the um, guard bee will come up and bite the returning forager on either its body or wings generally. Next comes flexion, which you can see here, the, the, the guard bee will sort of uh, flex its abdomen inward as though it were going to sting, but the stinger doesn't actually come out. It's really just a threat that uh, if, if the behavior continues, it's going to sting. The last behavior is stinging, obviously, and it is the most aggressive of all the behaviors and also the least common. So these behaviors are each weighted here, as you can see, based on their severity. And based on each of these aggression uh, assays, on, and the behaviors that we observe, we can calculate an aggressive uh, aggression score for each assay. So once we were able to sort of um, investigate or gauge the, the temperament, the general temperament of the guard bees, we wanted to be able to gauge their temperament towards bees that we knew had visited the feeder. In order to do this on the very first day of data collection, right before we would start the experiment, we would pick sort of five healthy looking bees that were foraging at the feeder and we would paint them with specific colors. After that, once, if we ever saw that bee again, either at the hive or at the feeder, we would record what we saw. And most importantly, we would record any aggressive behaviors we saw uh, guard bees uh, perform towards that painted forager. And we would note that. Lastly, we wanted to be able to, to sort of um, account for activity, because as you can see here, based on a number of factors, you can have a tremendous amount of activity at the landing board, or you can have relatively little activity. And so we measured this in a similar way to the aggression assay, and we just counted all the bees for one minute that we would see enter the hive, and we would repeat this every 10 minutes over an hour long period. We would do something similar at the feeder, we would count all the bees at the feeder, and then we would repeat this every 10 minutes. So for our results at this time, data analysis is still in progress, but I can share sort of our preliminary observations from our data so far. Firstly, we observed, I believe, an average of twice as much activity uh, at the hive uh, on days at which sucrose was present at the feeder than days when honey was at the feeder. At the feeder, we observed an average of 3.6 times as much activity on sucrose days. So here I've sort of represented all of uh, the painted bee sightings that we saw at the hive. We never saw a painted bee experience more aggression than sort of an antenation. So I've represented all of these sort of sightings as the percentage of times that they were antenated or experienced sort of any aggressive um, behavior from a guard bee. And you can see here that it is slightly more likely to be antenated on days uh, that honey was at the feeder than days that sucrose was at the feeder. Finally, for general aggression, we saw an average of 1.77 times as much aggression on sucrose days. So guards were generally more aggressive when sucrose was at the feeder than when honey was at the feeder. So we kind of got some unexpected results here and we wanted to sort of uh, see what, investigate some potential explanations for that. Our first potential explanation is that we did see significantly more activity at the hive on sucrose days. And this could have caused sort of um, more more bees uh, found sort of sucrose to be more rewarding than honey, which led to sort of more activity and as a result, more aggression. We also saw more feeder activity. Because there are more bees at the feeder, there's more potential sort of for this conspecific conflict or competition at the feeder. So just um, foragers from the same hive competing with one another for these nectar resources. And this could also be something that triggers more aggression. 
We also used a 50% sucrose solution uh, for our sort of uh, nectar analog or our control. This is a pretty highly rewarding um, sort of analog. And we do this because depending on the time of year, it can also be like pretty difficult to train these bees to forage the specific feeder. They don't necessarily feel motivated to do so. So this is very highly rewarding, but it could also be, as opposed to specifically honey that activates these, uh, this sort of aggressive behavior, it could be that a high sugar content could be triggering this behavioral and genetic change, not specifically honey. So in conclusion, we found that painted bees experienced slightly more aggression uh, from guards when honey was at the feeder. Guards were not generally more aggressive when forages were returning with honey and were in fact generally more aggressive when they were returning with our sucrose solution. So at this time, further analysis is gonna be needed first to analyze our results and then to determine the exact cause of these behavioral changes that lead to robbing behavior. But we do think that this study is sort of a very good place to start. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Taylor. But really fascinating, um, trying to understand the behavior of, of these bees. Um, we have time maybe for a quick question from the audience, if there's one. And if not, um, so I have one. Um, and, and that would be, um, you know, what role does time play here? Um, do you, you know, in terms of, you know, if, if you extended your study for longer periods of time, right, would you expect more aggressive behavior perhaps um, to show some variation between the sucrose and honey sources? Yes, that's actually one of the things we actually observed. What we would do is every day for our data collection, we would spend half an hour before the study and just let them get sort of acclimated and go to store to feed at the feeder. But what we did observe, even in spite of that sort of half an hour grace period, is that over time, we saw more activity at the feeder and sort of more aggression over time. So if we maybe extended this for two or three hours, we might see that start to level off. Okay. Okay, cool. And then also, but what about time also in terms of, I think in your intro introduction, you said something about um, uh, the, like this robbing behavior happening later in the season. Um, so that would, that would, I guess, yes. like more days or, or how does that correspond to the life? Yes. Um, I'm, I'm blissfully ignorant here. <laughs> that's just fine. Um, specifically, I imagine if we started later on in the season, because we did perform this um, sort of over the last, I think uh, we did June and July, I believe. If we if we started later in the season, we could probably, for one, start with a less rewarding um, sort of solution at the feeder because they would be more motivated to feed at the feeder. We did also see sort of generally a little more um, activity at the feeder later on in the season, which could suggest that they were more motivated to, to feed there. Okay, awesome. And then Evie asked, well, first she says, great job. And then she asked if you face oh, you. Challenges, um, in the research. Can you repeat that? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, she asked um, if there were some specific challenges um, that you faced in the research project itself. What were some challenges that we faced? Well, feeder training, for one thing, can be a, a real challenge, especially if you start really, really early, mm -hmm. because there is such like uh, nectar availability they really aren't interested at all in your fear. And so you can you can spend that first first day of, of um, working with a colony, you can spend upwards of like many hours out there before they really start getting interested. <laughs> and so you, <laughs> you um, have to start with a pretty rewarding solution. And you also start with this sort of feeder really, really close to the hive and you progressively move it further and further away until you get to the spot where you wanna have it at for your experiment. And okay. so you, you have to, if they're, if they're not motivated to go there, then you have to move them. So naturally, it takes uh, more time to move it further, further away, and also more time to get interested at the beginning, which is what takes the longest, is to be interested in the feeder at all, even if, if it's right at their doorstep. Yeah, I know, for sure. Okay, well, awesome. Well, thank you so much, Taylor. This was great. Learned thank a you. lot new here. So. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, so now is Alexander. That's me. <laughs> okay, Alexander, the floor is yours. All right, let me share my screen real quick. Can you guys see that? Yes. All right, so 
I'm going to be talking about some of the bioinformatics work that I've done um, looking at bacterial cellulose production in uh, the genus Comagadiobacter and how pangenomics can be used to uh, sort of aid in our understanding of that. All right, uh, so for part of the introduction, um, so the pangenome is essentially a summary of the genetic diversity that's present in a genomic data set and it consists of a core pangenome and an accessory pangenome. And the core pangenome is like the genes that are shared between all of the strains. And the accessory pangenome is uh, the genes that are not shared between all the strains. So there are relatively few pipelines out there um, that are really used to accomplish uh, this bacterial pangenomic analysis. So uh, this project was really aimed at sort of synthesizing all of the applications that are out there and developing a couple new applications to sort of streamline that analysis so it's not as much of a burden on the researchers. Um, so we chose to do this with the bacterial genus Comagadiobacter. And why did we do that? So the Comagadiobacter genus is unique because it's a really high producer of this exopolysaccharide cellulose. And there's an image of it there, uh, scanning electron micrograph. Um, and bacterial cellulose is really cool because it has uh, these structural and chemical features that are really great for uh, medical and biotechnology industries. So you can use it in like uh, bandages and wounds. Uh, it's a really cool industrial um, material. And, but the large scale success of the industry has really been limited by the amount of cellulose that these bacteria can produce. So through this uh, pangenomic study, we're going to try to find um, genes and loci that are associated with um, uh, increased production of this cellulose. Uh, so novel contributions, in addition to some of the previously published uh, applications, I developed a couple new applications, uh, specifically this 5050 software, which estimates that core and accessory pangenome um, between just two strains using BLAST-P. So it essentially looks at all of the genes in the genome and clusters them based on how similar they are. Um, and there was no code for this available in, uh, in the literature out there. People had described uh, you doing this method, but they hadn't actually published um, code for it. So I developed this and we will publish it. Uh, and then there's another cluster calling software that uh, you can use to pull operons from uh, the bacterial strains. So it uses a similar approach. We know the, the gene structure of these operons and it goes in and looks to see if those genes are associated together and then pulls out those sequences. And we can use that to sort of uh, examine the structure of those operons and see if they differ between uh, cellulose and non-cellulose producing strains. So here are the general methods that we used. Uh, first, in order to do any of this work, you have to source the genomes. And we did that from NCBI and this, uh, the genome taxonomy database. Uh, and then you have to make sure that the genomes are quality genomes. Uh, so we did that using a program called CheckM. Then you annotate the genomes to see what genes are present. Uh, and then we use the entire genomes to generate a phylogenetic tree using a program called MASHTree. And um, using that mastery and the 50-50 program that I generated, we can resolve any taxonomy disagreement that we have from the data that we generated and the data that are in NCBI and the genome taxonomy database. And then once we have all those data, we can calculate the pangenome at various uh, levels using a program called Rory. Um, so this is sort of uh, the first result that we got was just kind of a spreadsheet of all of the Comagadiobacter strains that are out there. And this is really useful for future studies. If anyone wants to do anything with the Comagadiobacter genus, we have sort of assembled all the information that's out there into a really neat spreadsheet. So the stuff on the left, the genome number, reported taxa, all of that is sort of the sourcing the genomes. And then on the right, you have the completeness and the contamination, which is the output from CheckM. So that gives you sort of an idea of the quality of the genome. So if it has high completeness and low contamination, you've got a really high quality genome. Um, you can see that most of these are pretty high quality. So uh, this is the output of MASH tree. Uh, it's a phylogenetic tree that was created using whole genome sequences. Uh, the taxonomic uh, names that are here are from the genome taxonomy database. And from this tree, we can really see that the taxonomy in the genome taxonomy database is essential. Oh, whoops. <laughs> 
I scroll all the way past. We can see that the taxonomy and the genome taxonomy database is uh, supported by our data because um, each of the species forms a monophyletic clade that's really nicely clustered together. Uh, I'll come back to the species that are boxed in a bit. Uh, this is an example output from the, develop, the newly developed 5050 program. Um, so you can see that it just it outputs a number based on the similarity between these two strains. So um, lighter colors indicate lower similarity, darker colors indicate higher similarity. So this sort of allows you to easily look at the similarity between two isolates and um, you can sort of infer taxonomy from that. If they're highly similar, they're likely the same species. Um, and this is um, sort of a visualization of the pangenome size calculated at various um, levels in the Comagatibacter genus. So I'll go back here. There were three different species there, and I sort of sampled the diversity present in the Comagatibacter genus. Um, the black numbers there are the core pangenome and the white numbers are the accessory pangenome. So essentially what you can take from this figure is that as you increase the diversity present in the uh, analysis, you lower the number of genes in the core pangenome and increase the number of genes in the accessory pangenome, which is kind of what we'd expect. Um, and then we did operon clustering using that uh, one of my developed programs where um, we uh, pull different BCS operons from the, uh, each of the Comagatia vector strains. So we did three different types of operons and uh, that clustering is finished. And now we need to do uh, multiple sequence alignments to examine structural differences. So there could be um, prophages or transposon insertions that um, decrease cellulose production by disrupting those operons and doing a multiple sequence alignment would show those differences in structure. And that could contribute to uh, a cellulose producer becoming a non-cellulose producer because uh, some sequence inserted in the middle of one of its operons. So we have yet to do that. So in conclusion, we've sort of generated a powerful streamlined tool to study uh, pangenomics at the genus level in bacteria. Uh, we developed a couple novel scripts uh, that will be published and provide a really easy way to generate figures and examine the structure of uh, BC operons. And we're currently inve investigating this economically important genus of bacteria to sort of improve bacterial cellulose production. And another important thing is that the pipeline is really written in a way that as uh, new applications are published, it'll be really easy to integrate them in. So it's sort of flexible in that it can keep up with um, newly published applications. Here are my references, acknowledgments, any questions? I have a chat. Yeah, that was great, Alexander. Um, so we'll, we'll start with, with a question from Evie who says, nice presentation. And she asks if you had to do it all over again, um, are there things that you would change or do differently? Um, um, would I change anything? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. I think I, I think I did a pretty good job. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's okay. You know, sometimes you do, um, especially if, if you find that success, right? Um, yeah. That, you, that you're looking for then. Um, and so then Luke Mo asks, if I understand correctly, the 50-50 program uses BLAST-P to generate scores by protein sequence and not gene sequence. So the 50-50 program was, um, if we use the protein sequences because that's what's previously been done in the literature. I'm sure you could use the gene sequence, um, but the the protein blast had been done previously in the literature, so we just kind of followed that. Okay. And so I, I guess I have just a, a little bit of a technical question because we're a group that that does computation and, and writes some codes and things. And so I'm just interested in 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 the software you developed. What what was the the coding language? And so it's a it's a Python script. It is okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cool. And are, were there particular tools then that you use within there? Um, uh, I mean, I kind of just uh, you can you can use Python to like access the pipe, like the the Bash pipe. I essentially just use that. So if you have the programs installed, it can access those and use them. So. 
So you're really just looking at connecting these different yeah, yeah. packages in, a, in an easy to use. Because they're all kind of scattered right now. And this this provides a really easy way to, you know, just use a couple lines instead of having to go bounce between programs and, and stuff like that. So absolutely. We some of our folks are doing that exactly right now. But yeah, so that's cool. All right. Well, thank you very much, Alexander. Thank you. Excellent. Stop problem. my share. And um, now we're going to turn now to a little more plant and soil science. And so Katie. Yes. Okay. You ready to go? Yes. Okay. Floor is yours. Hi everybody, my name is Katie Chang and today I am presenting my poster on examining effects of gold nanoparticles exposure on autophagy in C. elegans. My research mentor is Dr. Olga Tuska from the Department of Plants and Soil Sciences. So for some background information, neurodegenerative diseases affects nearly 50 Americans yearly and they are characterized by the accumulations of damaged protein and the decrease in autophagy. So the novel treatment for neurodegenerative diseases is um, trying to find ways to regulate autophagy. Gold nanoparticles, they have unique physiochemical properties that have shown to induce autophagy through the unknown pathway. So we propose to use the model organism C. elegans um, to examine the effects of gold nanoparticles on longevity's pathway via the skin script factors HLH30 or TFEB and FAL4 or FOXA and mammalian system that is involved in autophagy regulation. So our specific objectives were to identify the subletal concentration of gold nanoparticles that can induce mild stress in C. elegans by using mortality, growth, and reproduction as endpoint. We also want to examine the nucleus chain location of HLH30 and FAL4 after exposing uh, to gold nanoparticles and also how that affects the lifespan of C. elegans. We hypothesize that mild stress induced in C. elegans by exposing uh, to gold nanoparticles will activate the autophagy pathway via the skin skin factors HLH30 and FAL4 that result in increased lifespan. For our gold nanoparticles, they are um, citrate coated and they are in four nanometers in size and we will be using the ICPMS to, um, to measure the concentration of gold. Uh, for our C. elegans, well type strain and then the GFP strain were obtained from the GCG. For our mortality, we exposed the C. elegans uh, to 0, 5, 10, and 20 milligram per liter of gold nanoparticles for 24 hours without feeding. Um, for reproduction and growth, we expose um, the C. elegant eggs um, to 0, 10, and 20 of gold nanoparticles for 48 hours. For the nucleus chain location, um, we, uh, we select the transgenic strains for the, G, for the HLH30 and FAL4, and then we expose them to gold nanoparticles at 0, 10, and 20 uh, milligram per liter of gold nanoparticles for 24 hours without feeding, and then we use DIP to stain the nuclei. For the survival assay, uh, we expose the C. elegans from L1 stage um, to 0 and 10 of gold nanoparticles for 48 hours. And then we um, use the kaplan myers uh, survival analysis to compare the control and then the exposed nematodes. For our result of reproduction, we see that the nematodes that have been exposed to gold nanoparticles at 20 milligram per liter show a significant decrease in the first phase of reproduction, but a complete recover um, to the control level in the second phase of reproduction. Um, for the phases of reproduction, the first is the first 48 hours after exposure, and then the second phase of reproduction is the additional 12 hours of reproduction. We also did not see any difference um, between the control and the 10 milligram per liter um, of gold nanoparticles. For the effects of growth, we see that the nematodes that have been exposed to 20 milligram per liter of gold have a um, significant decrease in surface area by 67%. And similar to reproduction, we do not see any difference between the control and the 10 milligram per liter of um, gold nanoparticles. Um, for the nucleus gene location, uh, figure three show the positive control for FAL4 after exposing to heat at 34 degrees Celsius for two hours. In figure um, four, 
this is a uh, show that after exposing to gold nanoparticles um, for FAL4, um, there was a partial nucleus chain location in the intestine region and um, in the Ghana region here. For HLH30, we also see the partial nucleus chain location and then an increase in expression in the intestine region as well after exposing to gold nanoparticles. For their effects on lifespan, after exposing the gold nanoparticles at 10 milligram per liter, we see that um, the nematode's uh, lifespan has been extended by uh, three days, and uh, that was using the kaplan meyer method to show that. So in conclusion, the sublethal concentration of gold nanoparticles that can induce mild to moderate stress in C. elegans are between 10 and 20 milligram per liter. We also see that um, gold nanoparticles induce expression and partial nucleation location uh, for FAL4 in the HLH30 and the intestine in the Ghana region. We see that the partial trend location of these transcript factors um, support our hypothesis about the gold nanoparticles playing a role in the pathway that is associated with longevity. Lastly, we see that the exposure of um, gold nanoparticles at non-toxic level to C. elegans activate the longevity pathway, resulting in an increased lifespan by uh, three days. I would like to acknowledge everybody in the lab that um, helped out with this project, as well as our findings. Thank you. All right, Katie, excellent. So again, first, um, questions from the audience? Not yet. So, okay, so now, now you're in trouble because I'm a chemist. And so, you know, it, it, it's interesting, right? That, you know, gold is considered a, a noble metal, right? So it's inact, it's unreactive. I mean, it makes gold oxides and things like this. And, and there's chemistry that binds to gold. You know, it, is there a picture that is known or is this something that you would try to draw in terms of what's happening biochemically? that's causing the toxicity? Or do you think it's really just an aggregation and sort of this clustering of the gold? Um, I'm thinking it's the clustering of the gold or like how it was ingested by the C. elegans. Mm -hmm. Also the um, coating of the gold could be um, what contribute to that as well. As I mentioned, um, the gold we used was citrate coated. Um, it potentially, it could be that the different coating have a different result in C. elegans. So that is something that we could potentially look at in the future. Sure. It was the was the citrate used to help with the uptake, just to provide sort of a more biochemically. Um, the, the citrate coating it was just to help that the goal from um, aggregating basically, so um, they they're more stable in solution. And, and remind me, what were the nanoparticle sizes? Oh, uh, they're in four nanometer. Four nanometer. Okay, so they're pretty small. Okay, no, that's excellent. Um, any other questions? Ah, so Evie asks, what led you to your interest in this research? Um, initially, it was the, um, the gold nanoparticles. I wasn't really... Uh, there was a lot of unknown, like we, um, Dr. Olga had worked with um, silver and zinc before, but the gold that we haven't really worked on before, and we just want to see how that would affect uh, C. elegans. Okay. All right. Um, excellent. Well, oh, here we go. Um, another question from Luke. What constitutes a toxic level of gold nanoparticles? Um, so the toxics, initially um, we do the mortality. Uh, we don't see a lot of um, mortality even at the higher concentration we can go uh, with the solution that we have, which was at 20 milligram per liter. Um, so we see uh, that decrease in the reproduction and a decrease in the developmental of the nematodes. So we're thinking that um, 20 might be really um, toxics to C. elegans that resulted in the decrease in reproduction and the growth of the nematodes. Okay, excellent. All right, Katie, well, thank you so much. Um, that was an excellent talk. And very interesting research project. So let's turn the floor over now to Josh. Um, there you go. All right, there we go. <laughs> Let's see, I'll share my screen. Life in Zoom. Yeah, it's something, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Let's see. Can everybody see that? All right, get my thing pulled up and then I'll be good to go. So hi everybody. My name is Josh L. And I'm a senior here at UK studying natural resources and environmental science. So this spring I had the pleasure of conducting undergraduate research in the lab of Dr. Hannah Poffenbarger in the Department of Plant Soil Sciences. Uh, and the study was also conducted in conjunction with Dr. Ole Windroth, also of the, the Department of Plant Soil Sciences, and with the assistance of Jason Walton, Waffle Malik, Sarah Carter, and Laura Harris. I'd also like to thank Sam Leupold and Dan Quinn for their assistance with the statistical analysis in this presentation. So this research project investigates the ways in which no-tillage agricultural practices affect uh, corn growth in conjunction with other soil amendments, namely the application of various amounts of nitrogen fertilizer. So no-till agriculture has become increasingly popular since the 1970s and early 1980s, uh, particularly in the eastern uh, half of the United States. In the most basic sense, no-till agriculture is the planting of crops in a field using minimally invasive processes. So on a large scale, seeds are typically deposited into the ground using a purpose-built no-till seeder, which only moves enough soil and residue to uh, deposit the seed. Uh, in contrast, conventional tillage is a broad term which encompasses several different techniques and practices. This is what people typically understand as plowing. Um, so these Practices differ slightly, but they all disturb the top six to 10 inches of the soil in some fashion in order to warm and aerate the soil and uh, also mix in crop residues for uh, previous seasons. So what this disturbance allows for is an earlier planting, but can also lead to serious soil erosion issues as plowing breaks up the soil structure and leaves it susceptible to wind loss and washouts. No-till has several unique benefits uh, when compared with conventional tillage practices. It builds and retains soil organic matter, preserves soil structure, promotes soil flora and fauna diversity, and crucially prevents erosion and runoff. These are important benefits in the face of climate change and widespread, or widespread topsoil loss across the country. So this study more specifically focuses on the impact of no-till practices on volumetric water content within the soil, uh, as well as subsequent effects on total grain yield. So based on previous literature, we hypothesize that no-till practices lead to greater soil moisture retention within the crop rooting zone, the 60 centimeters below the soil surface where the majority of crop roots are found. So this study was conducted on the Blevins Long-Term Tillage Study Plot, a 50-year-old research field located on UK Spindletop Farm. You can see the basic map of the plot up here in figure one. And the field is split in four columns, each with a variety of different nitrogen application rates. The purpose of the study for soil conditions were examined conventionally tilled with no nitrogen applied, conventionally tilled with 168 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare applied, no till with no nitrogen applied, and no till with 168 kilograms per, of, of nitrogen per hectare applied. So a climate soil sensors were also installed in the field in order to collect data on volumetric water content. You can see those down here in figure three. And we also collected data on rainfall quantities over the study period as seen in figure five. So this data was collected in the summer of 2020 and analyzed and represented using our statistical software. So we found that there is a statistically significant difference in soil moisture content between the no-till and conventionally tilled plots across, across nitrogen rates represented here in figure four. In the figure, the blue bands represent no-tillage treatment and the red bands represent conventional tillage. So the areas where the uh, confidence bands do not overlap is where significant differences in volumetric water content between the treatments are apparent. And the results indicate that no-till practices retain soil moisture in greater quantities and for longer than conventionally tilled plots. Uh, this is likely the result of greatly improved soil structure and pore space in the no-till uh, plots, which allows for greater soil moisture storage and use. No-till practices also leave crop residues and other organic matter intact at the soil surface, which greatly reduces evaporation. So this is really important because water availability is one of the biggest limiting factors in agricultural production right behind nutrient availability. So, and then the improvement in soil moisture retention is also reflected in grain yields as seen here in figure six. On average, no-till plots produce 26% more grain than conventionally tilled plots. And the difference in yields is really most pronounced um, in the plots that didn't have any nitrogen applied. So uh, here, the no-till plots produced 85% more corn than conventionally tilled plots, which is a, a pretty significant difference in is a great indicator of how important um, water is in the whole crop production process. So if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. No, this is great. I, I grew up in farm country in Kansas and so. <laughs> oh yeah, I was gonna say this is right up your alley then. Yeah, so this is, this is awesome. Um, I guess maybe just a, a first question. Um, you know, I, I'm assuming where you 
where you've done this testing, it's on land that had been conventionally plowed in the past. And so for like, I mean, say you came across some new land, right? That you wanted to start to, to farm. Um, could you use no-till farming without plowing first? Um, or, or do, does it, or can you just go and, and just you know, sort of get going and, and, and that's it. <laughs> a lot of like that initial plowing, right? Is to kind of get the field. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it used to be the case that you would have to, um, you'd have to plow it to get rid of the sod because it's usually what happens is you've got this big grass field that you're like okay i gotta get rid of all of this so that i can plant my my grain crop right. um so typically i guess before the green revolution what that looked like is you'd have to till the field and you know get rid of everything but with the advent of chemical fertilizers and i guess also herbicides mm -hmm. what a lot of people do is if they want to convert to no-till they'll just go through and chemically terminate um, everything that's growing there which yeah it, it's got its trade-offs there <laughs> but it does keep the soil structure intact. Sure. Okay. So, um, Abby asked a question. Um, do you see a direct application that you might see implemented by your findings? Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I think just a, a widespread or a larger adoption of no-till because uh, it's it's popular, but it's not as popular as conventional tillage. Most farmland in the United States is still conventionally tilled. Uh, which is really not great because we're losing a ton of topsoil every year. And that is very important for growing stuff. So um, I guess the, the direct application here is making no-till more appealing to farmers. Um, it also means it's, it's, it can be a little bit less work too. You don't have to you know, till the field and do all that, get the field ready. Really all, all you have to do is um, apply fertilizer plant and then you got to weed periodically and that's it. Okay. So, you know, one of the first speakers, Anissa, mentioned, you know, based on her results that they had planned some sort of education, educational materials, um, you know, I can imagine, or have you thought about, right, the development of, of these kinds of materials for those that may, at least right now, prefer traditional farming techniques? Yeah, I've thought about it a little bit. I think it's a, an important avenue to go down with this kind of research. So, because, I mean, if nobody knows about it, then nobody's going to use it. Yeah. Yeah, but then there's all sorts of over, you know, barriers to overcome. Uh, you're just mm -hmm. you're just this researcher from the university coming to tell me what I'm going to do, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. This is great. Um, thanks for for sharing your research. Let's see. Okay. So. There we go. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. And so, Caleb, are you ready? I am. Thank you. Okay. You can share your screen. Okay. And as soon as you tell me you can see it, I'll go ahead and start and I'll move the zoom out of the way. All right, so my name is uh, Caleb Gooden. I'm a sophomore agricultural and medical biotech major. And today I'm going to be presenting the research I've completed with Dr. Arthur Hunt, um, investigating the role of task three and root nodulation in trifolium pretense. Um, so trifolium pretense or red clover is an important crop in Kentucky agriculture. Um, it's very high in protein. It can grow very dense. It can grow very quickly. So um, farmers typically use it in pasturing for animals and for hay. Um, the reason why it's so widely used is because as a legume, um, it can adapt to its environment by changing its root structure. Um, so the top of this figure here shows the formation of a normal root. So this right here is uh, through, this formation is lateral root development and lateral roots are just secondary roots that come off of the primary system. Um, so these roots are typically better for uptaking water and minerals from the soil. Um, the bottom of this graphic shows the formation of a root nodule, which is what we're interested in. So the root system interacts with soil bacteria called rhizobia. Um, and when that interacts with this root system, it forms a nodule here, and those better fixate nitrogen from the soil. Um, but the issue is that in Kentucky, the wild type is typically seen to be the lateral root system. Um, and that leads to the application of a lot of nitrogen fertilizer to the soil. Um, and that can be pretty harmful to the environment. Um, so we're interested in looking at the nodulation of these plants. So the way that it does this is through alternative polyadenylation. So 
polyadenylation by itself is just the attachment of a poly A tail um, to an mRNA transcript, which I have shown here, um, which is important for cellular transport and for post uh, transcriptional control. Um, so alternative polyadenylation is just when you have two of these sites. So uh, you can see that there's a weak poly A signal and a strong poly A signal. So um, the cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor will attach here, basically tell um, some enzymes to cut, and then it'll attach a poly A tail right there. And so when you have this happen, there's a long transcript that gets expressed, um, and this will express these microRNAs right here. Um, and I'll explain those in the next slide. But an important note for this research is that there's two signals. So the weak poly A signal interacts as well. And it'll do the same thing. It'll attach, it'll attach the CPSF to this region here, uh, cleave the rest of this off, and then attach a poly A tail to the proximal site. So this has been shown to affect root development in other plants. Uh, namely metacogo truncatula. So the diagram I've shown here is that pathway in metacogo. So this is the TAS3 and MIR390 pathway. MIR390 is a microRNA, like I mentioned earlier. A microRNA is just a single-stranded non-coding RNA um, that functions to silence and regulate um, RNA post-transcriptionally. So in this graphic here, there's two poly-A sites which flank uh, this section of the graphic. So when you cleave at the, poly, uh, the distal poly-A site, um, you get the expression of MIR390, um, and it forms these transacting small interference RNAs or TASI RNAs. And in this case, it's interfering with the auxin response factors two, three, and four. And those response factors are responsible for um, forming relationships with the nodules and roots. So when you express MIR390 and you have the long transcript of the mRNA, you get the inhibition of nodulation, but the prioritization of lateral roots. They found that overexpressing MIR390 and TAS3 and Metacago led to increased lateral root development. Um, and if you knock that out, um, then you get lower lateral root development. So this has not been studied in red clover yet, um, but we anticipate that the proximal site, so the site that doesn't produce the, the microRNAs, uh, will lead to a higher quantity of root nodules. Um, so before I could get down to studying the actual um, mechanisms of this pathway, I had to prove that it existed because no one's looked at this yet. So I did this uh, through a three prime race. So this uh, graphic at the top here shows the coding region for TAS3 and red clover. Um, and so there are three unique sites for forward primers that we'll use in PCR. So we have the A and the, the B and the C site. But each of these has a similar three prime site. So when you do PCR uh, using these primers and the TAS3 transcript, you will get three unique results and each will have their own, we each will have a different length um, on a gel. So um, I did this preliminary analysis and once I proved that those sites existed and there were different sizes, I went ahead with the race. Um, so we attached library tags and sequence tags to each of these um, before moving forward. And here you can see that if I did a, a PCR with A in the three prime primer, then it would have the site for A, it would have this site for B, and it would have this site for C because it includes all of this region right here. So if I include a library tag on the end and I do the, the, the PCR again on that product with the original um, A primer and three prime, and I do the PCR with B in the three and C in the three, then you should see all three um, of those regions from the product. And that's what you can see here at the bottom. So the long transcript did produce all three, um, the B transcript produced two and the C produced one, which is what we expected. So um, I went ahead and attached the rest of the library tag to sequencing. Um, and that was just to get sequence results of task three. Um, before I move forward with that, we did a qubit analysis, which was just to confirm the quality of the DNA. Um, it showed that it was concentrated enough to do anything with. So once those results were returned, uh, we got the sequencing reads, and I transformed them uh, through bioinformatics into what's called a track. This is the track right here. Um, so this is a very blown out 
view of the sequencing reads that were returned. And if you zoom in on any one of these regions, you'll see a long series of nucleotides. The dense regions on the graph here show um, areas where there were similarities to a poly A sequence, a poly, like a, a sequence where a poly A tail would be attached. Um, but if you zoom in, so you can see, I've circled the ones that were the highest density. You can see those on, um, on the graphic here. But if you zoom in, you'll actually find that most of these are artifacts. And so they're nonsense and there aren't real poly A sequences. So what I had to do to find the real ones was to take um, reads from a previous project and cross-reference them with my own. So this is a, a track from previous Red Clover study. Um, and you can see there's density right here and there's density right here that overlap between the two. Um, and so I identified those as potential poly A sites and I've marked them on the graphic that I showed earlier. So this again is the, is the coding region and then I have the two poly A sequences. Um, so next I had to confirm that MIR390 was inside um, task three in Red Clover to make sure that the pathway would exist. So I took a MIR390 site, which is right here from a Arabidopsis, and I blasted it against the uh, sequence of task three from Red Clover and found that there was a 100% match right in the middle between these two poly A sites. So not only did that confirm that those were poly A sites, but it also confirmed that it likely participates in the MIR390 task three pathway um, in Metacago uh, to promote lateral root development. So then I went through a uh, primer design using CLC genomics workbench, uh, which is the program I used for the rest of this analysis. Um, and these primers are right here. So we have one common forward primer, but we have two reverse primers. So we can do um, individual analyses of these sites. <clears throat> so I'm gonna use those primers to do a, what's called a um, real-time PCR analysis, uh, quantitative real-time PCR. So what that does is it combines uh, the actual PCR and the analysis into one step, and I can do multiple um, samples at one time. So I don't have to do a whole bunch of single PCR reactions and piece them all together. And I can also use RNA and go directly into reverse transcription to cDNA and then do the, um, the analysis. So what that's going to do is it'll show the relative expression of TAS3 in root nodules and in lateral roots from Red Clover. And what we expect is that lateral roots during this analysis will display higher levels of TAS3 um, because of the MIR390 expression and inhibiting nodulation. So conversely, we should see lower levels of TAS3 in nodules. Um, so after that, we're going to conduct what's called an agrobacterium gene transfer. So we'll use the bacterium agrobacterium tumefaciens um, I will construct an altered version of TAS3 using PCR, uh, which is basically going to replace the second poly A site with a different poly A site um, found in Red Clover. Um, I'll anneal those together and insert them into the bacterial, into the bacterium. Um, and once we infect plant with the, plants with that, then the um, agrobacterium will sort of throw the construct that I made into the nucleus of the host cell and it'll intercalate and then start to produce it by itself. Um, so once we grow that from the infected callus tissue, uh, which is like looks like little orbies on the plant, um, it's just the infection caused by agrobacterium. So once we grow that into an embryo and then from an embryo into a plant, then we should see um, lower levels of lateral root development in the adult mutants uh, due to that constructed TAS3 region, uh, which will essentially make the alternative polyadenylation lower um, because the second site won't be there to participate. Uh, so some acknowledgments for this project, um, the Hunt Lab, Dr. Arthur Hunt's been an incredible mentor for me and I'm gonna be continuing this project with him for the next one or two years. Uh, for ABT395. Uh, the Dinkins Lab, for their collaboration with this project, they provide a lot of the samples that I use for analysis. The United States Department of Agriculture for funding this project, and also the UK College of Agriculture, Food and Environment. Uh, they've been responsible for funding a small portion of this project as well. So that is the end of my talk. I'd love to take questions. All right, Caleb, excellent. Um, so we have time for um, just one question. 
Um, and I'll read it from, from the chat here, and it's from Luke Mo. He, he asks, any idea what contributes to the relative abundances of the different task three transcripts? And would this change according to tissue development stage, et cetera? Okay, yeah. So um, in Metacago, we saw that the abundance of task three was inhibit was um, different uh, mm -hmm. depending on whether it was in lateral roots or in nodules. So we think it's that pathway is what's contributing to that difference in task three transcripts. So um, when the alternative polyadenylation attaches at the second site, then the MIR390 is what's contributing to the task three. Um, so when we knock that out and we just express the, the, the uh, proximal site that contributes nodulation, um, then we won't see as much task three. I think that's what you're asking. Um, so as far as changing in tissue, yes, we have to do it in lateral roots and in nodules because that's the only part of uh, the plant that would be expressing task three at all. Um, and until they express lateral roots or nodules, we can't um, move forward with the PCR because uh, task three won't be expressed in any other part of the plant or it, it won't, it would basically be inert in the primary root system, so. Okay, well, thank you, Caleb. Um, thank you. So excellent job. Um, but in the interest of time, we need to, to move forward. Um, so Kate, are you ready? Yes. Okay. All right. My name is Kate Drabs and I'm a hospitality management major here at Kentucky. Um, today I will be presenting on transformative experiences through solo female leisure travel. Before I begin, I'd just like to take a moment to thank Dr. Pei Zhang for helping throughout this whole process. To start, solo female leisure travel is a growing market segment, with about 84% of solar travelers being women. This study that I'll be presenting today seeks to uncover the positive experiences, negative experiences, and constraints that happen during solo female travel, as well as any transformations experienced following said travel. Much of the prior research on solo female travel has to do with constraints and benefits. When looking at prior research, three types of constraints were identified, physical, psychological, and societal slash cultural. Physical constraints are those that involve the individual's physical space and sexual harassment is an example of this. Psychological constraints are those that are non-physical and have to do with the mental and emotional well-being of the individual. Loneliness is a common example of a psychological constraint. Lastly, societal slash cultural constraints are those having to do with the societal norms of the destination or at times having to do with the traveler's own culture. Both discrimination and familial pressure are examples of societal slash cultural constraints. The primary benefits that were uncovered when looking at the prior research were freedom and independence, inclusivity, feeling self-assured and competent, feeling inspired and reinvigorated, and having a better sense of self. When collecting the data for this study, 30 anonymous solo female travel forum entries were analyzed from the websites TripAdvisor, Lonely Planet, and Reddit. Subforms and threads specifically relating to the research objectives were examined in order to find relevant entries. And some entries had to do with specific locations while others were more generalized experiences. Looking at the results, the two primary transformations that were discovered were self-confidence and strength and global awareness. 20% of women experienced global awareness following travel, while 23.3% of women experienced more self-confidence and strength in themselves. However, 57% of women did not explicitly discuss any transformative experiences and tended to focus on their experiences during travel instead. Moving to the top right-hand corner, the positive experiences, negative experiences, and constraints that were observed are listed. The primary positive experience having to do with the inner self was feeling free and independent, which relates to prior research. 
12 women stated that they felt safe during their travels, which contributed to their positive views on solo travel in general. And connecting with the local culture and being able to socialize with local people allowed for women to become more culturally aware after travel as well. The main negative experiences were associated with feelings of fearfulness or discomfort resulting from physical threats, namely physical or sexual harassment. 20 of the 30 women did not explicitly state any negative experiences associated with their travels, while 15 of the 30 women did not list any constraints specific to being a solo female traveler. Lastly, women who had more positive experiences during travel tended to have more transformations following travel. To conclude, solo female leisure travel is, can have a profound impact on how women perceive themselves. Women can become more connected to the world than they would have otherwise been able to through socializing, connecting to new cultures and new ways of life. Prospective solo female travelers may be more inspired to take the leap and take on this type of travel if they are aware of the experiences of seasoned solo female travelers. This research also provides some guidance to the tourism industry as to how to better serve this market group. I want to note that there are some limitations to this research, namely the small data set, possible changes in the information over time, and just the constraints of collecting online data. Further research can definitely be done on this topic by just going more in depth on solo female transfer, tra transformations specifically. Thank you. All right, Kate, awesome. That's really cool stuff. Um, especially hopefully now that people can start to travel again. Soon. Exactly. <laughs> um, I was struck I if I heard you right by one of the things that you said at the introduction that it was, what, is it really 84%? Of solo yes. Leisure yeah, women? as of um, 2020, 2021, the solo travel market um, consists 84% of women. Do you know why? Or do people have people posited, you know, hypotheses as, as, as to why? I'm not sure. You, you know, this, this certain topic is still relatively unresearched. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a big reason I chose to take on this research. I was really interested in just learning more, especially because this is such a new topic sure. that researchers are discussing. So okay. it's definitely something to think about in the future, though. Okay. And then I guess one other question that I had, too, is, I mean, so you use terms like um, greater self-confidence or greater strength. Um, you know, are there, I mean, those seem very subjective, right? Are there um, maybe more objective ways of, of doing this, or is it just because of the nature of the surveys? I think there was definitely constraints with the online form entries. Mm -hmm. I do think my next step in this process is to either provide my own survey or interview solo female travelers, just to go into more of the specifics sure. of transformations and impacts following travel. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you very much, Kate. This was no this problem. Was, um, and we are, you know, starting to get close to the end of our time, and we do have one more speaker. So I think we're gonna go ahead and, and go to our final speaker, which is Jordan. Hello, hey, Jordan. We're ready whenever you are. Okay, I'm working on sharing my screen. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep, we're good now. Can you just blow it up maybe a little bit? Um, is that better or? Yeah, I don't think you'll, that's works. Okay, I okay. guess I can, I will scroll a little bit. Okay, so hi, my name is Jordan Hinton. I am a third year dietetic student and Kendra U was my mentor for this research. And basically this research is evaluating the impact of two student-led volunteer organizations here at UK, Campus Kitchen and Farm to Fork. And we're hoping to kind of quantify and determine the amount of food insecurity and food waste reduction we were able to, um, I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> we're hoping to determine how much we were able to reduce food insecurity and food waste in our community. So I'm gonna start by defining food insecurity because I think there's a common misconception of really what it means. Food insecurity is basically a lack of access to healthy and affordable food to support a healthy lifestyle. 
And we do know that about 18% of Kentuckians face some degree of food insecurity and college students face an even greater degree due to um, certain risk factors. And then on the other side of that equation, about 40% of food in the United States is wasted. So Campus Kitchen is a program specifically dedicated to addressing this gap between food waste and food insecurity here at UK. Um, and like I said before, it is a volunteer student-led organization that recovers food from the community, uses that food to prepare healthy meals, and then delivers those meals to people, to people in need. And then Far Farm to Fork is a sub-entity of Campus Kitchen here at UK that specifically addresses college student needs by providing educational nutrition information to college students, as well as serving free healthy meals on a weekly basis here on campus. And the purpose of doing this research was basically to quantify how, to what degree Campus Kitchen was able to reduce food waste and food insecurity. So we collected data from our eight recovery shifts, two food processing shifts, three cooking shifts, six meal delivery shifts, and one gardening shift that occurred every week between August 2018 and December 2019. And the data we were looking at specifically was the amount of food we were able to recover, the amount of meals we were able to deliver, and then the amount of volunteers coming in and out of our kitchen each week. On the farm to fork side of things, we used a farm to fork end of survey evaluations, end of semester evaluation survey to collect information about student demographics. We also use an 18 item Likert scale to evaluate the program. And then we also looked at students attendance of meal, uh, meal, of meal attendance frequency. Um, and to kind of incentivize people to answer the survey, we used a drawing for a $10 Kroger gift card as well. So to summarize our findings, we found that Campus Kitchen was able to bring in about 2,400 volunteers over the course of one year, and that equaled out to about 4,800 service hours that volunteers dedicated. So clearly that kind of speaks to the student impact of the organization just on the volunteer side. Um, we found that Campus Kitchen was able to recover about 15,000 pounds of food, and that food came from places like local grocery stores, including Kroger and Whole Foods, as well as UK dining halls and some restaurants on campus. And there's like a small note underneath that statistic in the results box. That's pretty significant. Um, about 7,000 pounds of those food, that food was produce. Um, and like I said before, food insecurity has a lot to do with people not having access to healthy food. So it's really important that we were able to bring in that food that would otherwise be wasted like fruits and vegetables and redistribute it to the community to improve their overall nutrient intake. And then from there, using that recovered food, we were able to create about 8,839 meals, half of which were farm to fork meals that went directly towards students. And then finally, we were able to serve or redistribute about 5,000 pounds of food. And what I say when I mean, what I mean when I say redistribute is that we did not use some of the food we recovered to make into meals, but instead we just simply brought it to our kitchen and then determined like what organization could use certain bakery items, prepared pastas, the frozen meats that we were recovering. Um, and then on the farm to fork side of things, we had about 629 farm to fork attendees total over the one year period. And a little less than half of those attendees did complete our survey. And from that, we found that about 30% of students attended farm to fork um, seven or more times in a semester. So that's about half the weeks in a given semester. And as farm to fork meal attendance increased, we found that students reported greater overall food security, in, in, uh, including greater access to fruits and vegetables, as well as increased academic focus, decreased stress levels, and an overall sense of belonging on campus. And then our key findings over on the side here, they just kind of summarize like our findings per month. So Campus Kitchen was able to bring in about 2000 pounds of food each month from our partners. And then we were able to serve between 1,000 and 1,160 1,160 meals each month. We were also to, able to engage between 500 and 780 volunteers each month. And then on the farm to fork side of things, like I said before, as the meal frequency a, attendance of meal frequency increased, we did see an improvement in students' reported food security, as well as improvements in their realms of academic, social life, and motivation to utilize local foods. And then. To conclude our research, basically, we used our findings, including data and the survey, positive survey feedback to kind of conclude that Campus Kitchen and Farm to Fork were effective at both reducing food waste in our community, as well as serving free and nutrient dense meals back to the community, completely free of charge. And then Farm to Fork, yes, it did serve healthy meals to students and there was like a big food component to that. 
But our findings also kind of show that there was a very positive psychological impact of being able to share a meal with other students in the community. Um, and it did have a positive impact on their overall stress levels, as well as their academic success, which is a big component of someone's like college career and like how they perceive their college experience to have gone, I think, is like their ability to connect with the community and feel supported by that community. And then moving forward with this research, we'd really like to encourage other institutions or universities to kind of utilize the similar resources that we have, such as um, student volunteer hours and the amount of food waste that's generated on a typical college campus to be able to kind of recreate similar programs on their community campuses and address food insecurity and food waste in similar ways that we have. And then I will take any questions and try to zoom out here. I have to unmute myself first. That was fantastic, Jordan. Um, Thank you. Well, one, it's, you know, I think the students are to be roundly applauded for the efforts here um, that you were able to, to nicely capture. Um, so, I mean, do you, you know, from what you're finding here, you, you sort of pointed to a lot of positive things. Did you, were you able to identify maybe inefficiencies in the programs that could actually lead to maybe better outcomes, better outcomes Absolutely. than what you're seeing already? Absolutely. And I think that's probably going to be our next operation is trying to determine how much food our campus kitchen like organization wasted using that recovered food. And I think one of the biggest challenges we faced was that a lot of the food we were bringing in was like likely past its expiration date. Um, so verging on not being usable. And I think a lot of times we didn't think through how to effectively use that food right away. So it ended up being that like we would recover food, yes, but then we wouldn't distribute as much as we recovered because some of it went to waste in our campus, in our kitchen. Um, and we were able to utilize composting for like the last, I think, three-ish months of this operation, like from when this data was collected. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, there was quite a bit of food waste that went straight to a landfill. So that's definitely something we could quantify going forward. Yeah, I was gonna ask that exact question about composting, right? <laughs> um, to see, so no, this is really cool. Um, are there other questions from the audience? And maybe not. Um, sometimes it's hard to be the last person <laughs> <laughs> to go. Um, but thank you, Jordan. This was really great. Uh, thank Jesse, you. Okay. Jordan, you. this is Jesse. I have a question for you. Um, great presentation, extremely exciting research. Um, what do you think was most exciting um, about this study? Hmm. I guess it depends who you're asking. Um, <laughs> since you're asking me, I would say that I think the most exciting part was that we were able to reach students specifically through Farm to Fork. Um, and this is not included in this study, but I think the fact that Farm to Fork continued continue through the COVID-19 pandemic really speaks to the amount of student impact that the program fostered prior to the pandemic, which is kind of like what I was touching on here. Um, so to me, the most exciting part was just be able to feed students and kind of support their overall sense of well-being on campus. Great. Awesome. Um, your passion for this is definitely palpable. Oh, thank you. <laughs> cool. All right, Evie and Jesse, um, I think we are done. Yes, I would just like to say thank you to all the student presenters. Very well done. Um, and I hope you have a good rest of the semester, what's left of it. Um, enjoy your summer. And if you're graduating, Godspeed to you in your next journey. Yep. yep, exactly. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. This was a fantastic session. Thank you. Thank you for hosting, Dr. Risco. That was my pleasure.